Thought Leadership from PwC. The most important thing for all the companies to realize, people that are listening, is everybody is starting at a different point. And even more importantly, everybody's trying to get to different spots. If you're a leader at this point, you have made bold commitments and goals. You have started to mobilize around that, but you probably have not fully hardwired it into the accountability and org structure, budgeting process, annual planning process. I think that's the next horizon. Continuing our Finance 2025 series with a conversation about incorporating ESG reporting in your transformation roadmap, this is PwC's Accounting Podcast. I'm Heather Horn, and thanks so much for joining us today. You know how in cooking, you can take two things that are pretty good on their own, add them together, and you get something that's even better? Think peanut butter and jelly, apple pie and ice cream, bagels and lox. That's exactly what we're doing with the two topics on today's podcast. Now, admittedly, these two topics added together may not quite get your mouth watering, but they will definitely give you a lot to chew on. Today, it's finance transformation meets ESG. If you've been listening to this podcast for more than a few weeks, you know that on Thursdays, we've had two main miniseries in the last few months. The current one, Finance 2025, was preceded by last fall's ESG reporting called Talking ESG. And by the way, if you missed those Talking ESG episodes, definitely go back and check them out. But also rest assured, we're planning lots more ESG content in the coming weeks and months. In any event, Today, those two worlds are coming together as we talk about a question that's on a lot of our listeners' minds. How do I incorporate the new demands of ESG reporting into the overall transformation plan and goals of my finance function? Both of our speakers are past guests of separate podcast episodes, but looking forward to mixing them together to talk about the intersection of transformation and ESG. David Chabay, Consulting Solutions Partner, and Brigham McNaughton, Managing Director in our ESG practice, are back to talk about what's top of mind for finance functions that are looking to get, don't groan, all of the right ingredients in their transformation recipe. We've got a lot to cover, so let's get started. So David Brigham, thanks so much for joining me and for coming back to the podcast. And I love this conversation we're going to have today because we're bringing together two of our podcast series. So I had Brigham on in the fall talking about ESG and David, obviously I had you on earlier talking about various current events and now to bring this together and talk about ESG and finance. So with all of that background, I think our key today is really to focus on put aside what you think about ESG, it's a coming, it's a not coming, but assuming it is coming, what should you be doing? And so maybe David, I'll start with you. And what do you see as an effective sort of strategy or, or where people should start? Yeah, it's a great question. I'd say the most important thing for all the companies to realize people that are listening is everybody is starting at a different point. And even more importantly, everybody's trying to get to different spots. And so knowing what you're trying to do first before you start doing the comparatives to to where other people are doing and, and where they're headed is important. And there's really three major groupings that we're seeing come out right now. So we've got some leaders. So some people that are without a doubt taking the, the first steps and they, they want to lead and guide the market. Um, they've got some people that are saying, hey, we're going to be fast followers. So we're going to let other people take the first steps and make some of the initial mistakes and learn from others. Um, but still get there very quickly. And then finally, we've got a group that is saying, you know what, we're going to we're gonna wait and we are going to meet every requirement that is put out, but we're not going to get ahead of the requirements. And the, the reason this is um, important is obviously it dictates not only the pace that you need to go at, but what activities you need to go do. And when we start thinking about um, why people are choosing these different strategies, most of them are market driven right now. So if somebody wants to be a leader, they're normally doing it because they're seeing um, some advantages, particularly with long-term cash flows with either their customers or stock positioning or lending positioning to create competitive advantage for themselves. And other people aren't seeing that for their, for their, uh, their group. 
All right. So one thing we all know about human nature is people like to benchmark and say, okay, how, where am I relative to everyone else? And I know you both have very non-scientific samples, but if you had to hazard a guess, if you were going to sort of put percentages into each of those categories, any sense, let's, let's focus maybe on public companies on how many are in each of those categories. Brigham, I'll take the first swing and, and you can, uh, you can clean up and tell me what you think. I feel like it's a probably about 20, 40, 40 right now um, in terms of, of leader, fast follower, and as required from percentage. But Brigham, Brigham what are you hearing? Yeah, I was, I was probably going to put it at maybe 10% in that leader category and then, yes, a split a, across, across the rest. I think it's important, and I know, David, you're going to get to this in a minute, but, but your point around know where you want to end up and that everybody's going to be in a different place. My view on this is it's really important that you know what problem you're trying to solve and that everybody has a different problem that they want to, want to solve. So your problem may be, I want to get in front of regulatory requirements. Your problem may be um, that you want to lower your, your cost of capital and tell your messaging to, to capital markets. It may actually be neither of those and, and might be more focused on getting the right talent uh, in the door and telling your story or in a customer proposition. So that conversation around leader, fast follower, as required, et cetera, I think also has to be deeply connected to um, an alignment as an organization around what problems you're trying to solve through your reporting. So maybe to that point is if we think about sort of the problem, obviously there's lots of different frameworks out there. There's lots of different developments. There's lots of demands from investors. I mean, it's like, it's constantly shifting. And I think Brigham, even from last time you and I caught up, which wasn't that long ago, things, you know, things have, have progressed. And so what do you say to someone as they say, look, I'm just going to hold off. I'm going to be in this final bucket, wait and see what's required. Is it okay to do nothing? Or do you need to at least have someone who's kind of in it and, and keeping track of at least what's going on? I think you need to have somebody in there that's that's keeping track of what's going on at a minimum because you need to understand what may come down and it is evolving constantly. Um, but I think, is, is it okay? I would question back and say, are, do you feel like activist investors may come in and say, hey, we need to do more here? Do you feel like your customers are going to demand more? Are you global and feel like you may have some pending tax issues? Are you going to actually try to reduce your carbon? And, and how quick are you going to do it? Have you made commitments to the market? Are they science-based? And so it's, it's not a question of, is it okay so much as, or can you meet all the commitments that you've got in the marketplace broadly? Yeah. And before I ask Brigham to chime in, I think it's almost that Brigham saying you need to know what problem you're trying to solve. And the fact is, unless you're monitoring this, you're not going to know what that problem is. But Brigham, what are you seeing? What, especially again, let's start with that last category, sort of the minimal effort that you would think they should have right now. I agree with everything that was just said. I think that there's some no regrets move that anybody listening can take. Number one, I would say, as we just said, make sure that you're reading up on the expectations and at least, you know, general sense of where regulatory requirements are, are, are going to go in the near term. I think number two is have some conversations internally, do some process walkthroughs, understand where your pain points are and what the challenge is going to be. I think at that point, you're making an informed decision. You know, you know how many days you need to take out of the process. You know how far away you are from you know, disclosure controls and procedures that everyone is comfortable with. And you can come together as an organization to decide, will we have enough time to build it based on the guidance that we're getting around when the timing of different regulations will come out? I think at this point, given the pressure in the system, stopping um, before you've done at least that level of due diligence to understand the scale of the problem is probably not advisable. I think that's helpful. And I'm going to come back actually to these three categories because I think later when we talk about action, we might want to split it up a little depending on where you are. But I definitely want to make sure anyone listening who's thinking, eh, we're, we're waiting there's more here for you to listen to. Like, like, don't turn it off now because there are some things, even if you're in that final category, you should be doing now. And I would say probably having spoken to both you guys, even if you're in that leader category, you're going to have some advice for and some things for them to think about. 
So with all of that backdrop then, David, let me go back to you and let's just level set overall. We've already alluded to a bit of this, but what are sort of the the different types of reporting or maybe better, like almost like different stakeholders or different places people need to be thinking about as they're considering ESG reporting? Sure. So let, let me cover off on the on the six, just so that we've got them in our categorization, um, and then we'll we'll get a little bit more on on each one of them. The first is is our investors in terms of the the annual reports, potentially quarterly that we're going to need to put out. The second is our lenders. Uh, the third is is our tax and regulators, um, both domestically and globally. Um, the fourth is customers and our and our clients, and the last two are both internal. One of them is internal kind of for tactical uh, reporting purposes, and the other is more for long-term strategic capital allocation goals. But when we talk about the first one, which is where a lot of people's focus is and where I believe a lot of people's focus should be, is really about investors. And, you know, Brigham, when you and I were were, uh, were talking about this, I mean, over the many conversations we've had, uh, you had some interesting viewpoints here that um, that I think would help people if you want to share some. I think they're coming together in different horizons uh, across these. So practical reality is that investors are pushing really, really hard. Capital market stakeholders are pushing hard. If you're in that fast follower leader, maybe you've stepped into a green bond or a sustainability linked bond. And so you, you've also brought in some of the lenders in, into this conversation in a unique way. But that pressure is causing clients to to make commitments and public statements. Once they do that, then they need to start making sure they've got the accountability in place. They've got the the right transparency internally. They've got dashboards. They can cascade and roll you know, the, their goals down into the organization so that each individual business unit leader knows what their personal obligation is and meeting the overall climate change goals or human capital goals, et cetera, of the organization. So I, I think it, it's a continuum that as if you're in that, fast follower or as required category, you're going to hit the investor reporting first. And then you're going to to likely over time make commitments that that you're comfortable with or, or that you negotiate. And then you're going to need to figure out how to operationalize them. Our clients that are leaders, we're finding them go probably the other way where they had customers, employees, internal reasons why they decided that they were going to make bold commitments, that they were going to focus on these issues. They've built up internal management processes, and now they're trying to get the external reporting for investors built to the right level that they're comfortable with over time. Yeah. The one thing I might add for the investor piece too is I've seen where some company executives have been pressured to make commitments in terms of when they're going to hit net zero carbon and be carbon neutral. And they don't have science-based targets yet, and they don't have an active plan. And that's just a tough place to be because you gotta you got to work extra hard to get there. So, Brigham, I want to go back to what you just said because this actually interested me. Well, there's two things so far that have interested me because David added a few categories that were not on my radar, and I feel like I'm watching this carefully. So I definitely want to get to those final categories. But I was also interested in this idea, and I don't want to over-pivot on this, but that investors are going to be sort of the first place people encounter it, and it's not going to be regulatory requirements. So it's not going to be the SEC's requirements or someone else's requirements, but it's more going to be because an investor is actually asking for for this. And I, I do think companies may tend to think about that differently, but I just want to make sure I understand stood what you were getting at. And obviously each circumstance is different, but we're talking generalities. Brigham McNaughton's view of the world. I'll step on my my personal soapbox for, for a moment here. What I perceive is happening is that investors have figured out how to make financial products, funds, how to compete for capital based on their sophistication and understanding environmental social governance factors, integrating those into their investment process. Because of that, they've created a market demand or they've created pressure on companies to make sure that they're providing the right transparency to inform those or to be eligible or um, to be able to deal with the, the proxy voting or stewardship pressures that are coming at them. And then the SEC uh, has looked at that dynamic and has understood that there are flows of capital now 
at scale that are moving around these issues. There's investment decisions being made on this information, and therefore it needs to have the right level of rigor. I don't think the SEC is is trying to create the the market transparency um, from scratch. They're trying to look at activity that is already occurring and make sure that there's a clear playing field and, and rules for investors to be protected. I think that's a great point. And I do think this is also a good time to add that obviously there are the existing SEC rules and we don't want people to forget about those. We're really talking here about incremental disclosures because hopefully companies at a minimum this year have already sort of put in place the right processes and and they're addressing those. So Brigham, I do think it's a good point. I also, the reason I wanted to sort of dwell for lack of a better word on this for a minute is that I think sometimes if I'm a corporate executive and I know my investor relations people are getting questions and the going to evaluation of my company and otherwise, that may be something that, you know, I really want to take action versus the fact that, oh, I know at some point in the future, maybe a regulator is going to come in and say, hey, you have to start disclosing these numbers. So I do think there might be a little bit different mindset in terms of responding to that. Yeah, absolutely. I think at this point, if you're a large public company, you're pretty far down that pathway with conversations with with your institutional investors. Um, If you're mid cap, small cap, that's probably still an emerging situation with dynamics with your investors. And it's also, you know, we use the word investors, right? As if it's, it's one like category. One population. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. I, I think the, the practical reality is at mainstream institutions, the stewardship teams are the ones that are really taking, taking point, driving engagement. Um, you have, individual financial products where you have analysts or portfolio managers that have created an ESG tilt that are being more focused on this. You have some broad-based institutional screens where maybe a a highly controversial or ESG laggard isn't going to be eligible for investment universe. But I think the, the mainstream analyst community is still coming to grips around what ESG is, how to put it into a discounted cash flow model or valuation uh, approach. And so when you talk to a client and say, our investors asking you, um, that's probably flowing more through a proxy governance stewardship conversation through your corporate secretary, more than it is, um, depending on your industry, uh, th- than it is coming through an investor call, an analyst call, et cetera. At this point, there are certainly industries where issues are so prominent or existential as part of their business model that it's absolutely for first and foremost. I think, you know, energy would, would be an example of that. Exactly. And I know people who listen regularly will know I that's the background that I come from. So hence why that would be top of mind for me. So before we go on, Brigham, was there anything else on lenders you wanted to add or otherwise I'm going to go back uh, to David for a few of these other categories? Yeah. So I think on the debt side, there's there's two dynamics people should be aware of. One is that increasingly ESG factors are flowing into the overall mainstream credit process. So whether that's a, a bank builds into their workflow, a screen for controversies or reputational risks that they don't want to be associated with. Right now, as banks have made net zero commitments, that is going to over time translate into decisions for whether they they extend credit to to companies um, and will have to mechanically get built into the process. So there there is a um, slow but increasing integration just into your mainstream lending decisions. And then separately, a lot of our clients, because there's significant appetite for it and, and good value, have entered into issuing debt instruments that are explicitly green or or sustainably linked. When you do that, the condition to be able to play is that you you have some sort of a a contractual term built into that for how the proceeds are going to get used or that it's linked to, to performance around these goals in some way. That then triggers a set of new disclosures, transparency reporting that needs to be controlled um, and, and provided on a timely basis. So it element of financing just has created a whole set of new use of proceeds type reports that people are having, CFOs are having to help manage. Well, and I think an important point there as well, Brigham, is that this isn't just that it's adding compliance. This is actually opportunity for companies. So if they're not thinking about this, that might be an area that they actually want to not just wait 
but be a little more proactive to say if it's something that would fit, you know, with their company or their company's financing. So something, something to think about there. So David, maybe going back to you, I, I want to get to these internal categories, but let's touch on the, the middle categories first so that we talked a bit about regulators, but you mentioned tax. So I want to definitely talk about that and then customers. So what are your thoughts on those? Yeah, absolutely. And actually, I'm going to go back just for a second to lenders. So oh, perfect. You know, one, one other piece, too, is the uh, MSCI ratings that have been coming out, too, have also been driving some activity. And those are, you know, weighted average adjusted. So there can only be so many people in the top rating. And so it's a comparative. Um, and there's definitely some companies that are trying to stay at the top. And then um, what we've also found is, is uh, there are some companies that should be higher rated but they're not because they're not uh, telling their story in, in the fulsome way that they're actually executing. And so there's a, there's a bunch of movement and learning for companies there. So David, before you go on, let me ask you a question because for some of our listeners, they may not be familiar with how ratings are being used in some of these decisions. And it's actually a topic we've talked about more broadly for an entire podcast, but you gave one example. I know there's others out there as well. In general, how are, what types of information are being used as these different types of ratings are being developed? Yeah, obviously the different rating groups have different components that they're looking at, but in general, they're looking at companies' resilience for, for long-term impacts for E, S, and G. And then kind of most importantly, if we were thinking about these ratings, is there's only so many companies that are allowed to be in each of the buckets. So only 5% could be AAA and 2% or 15% uh, AA. And so when we look at that, telling the story for a company for all the good things that they're doing is going to become increasingly important as we look at the cost of capital from the markets and from the lenders. And so it's this is not just about meeting a regulatory requirement. It, it's, it's evolving into additionally making sure that your story's out there to get, get the higher ratings and to have better access to capital. I would just jump into that, that it's really messy. So there are rating providers that index funds are taking the rating directly and that'll you know mathematically determine how much capital you get in it. You have active managers that are buying ratings and using those to inform a process. You also have investors, lenders that are ignoring the top level rating, but they're using them as data collection service providers. And they're bringing in the information that they've scraped from sources and bring it into their own workflow process that goes into their own internal or proprietary rating as well. So the challenge, if you're a CFO thinking about this space that's unfolding, is you, you have to understand the landscape, understand um, by talking directly with the investors that that you that are important for you, how they're using that ratings and those inputs, and then make sure you've got detailed checklists, et cetera, that, that you're working to optimize those. Because um, the way that most of the ratings will work is that Number one, they're only taking public information. Number two, they're you know scraping your disclosures that exist against a checklist or very narrow criteria for what qualify or account based on in your industry. And if you um, speak generally about a topic, but you're ignoring the methodology or the factors that they're bringing in, you're likely not going going to maximize your position. All right. Well, definitely seems like a topic for another podcast, but where actually I think it's interesting in looping us to our, our, our sort of next category is that some of the proposed um, EU CSRD rules actually would be disclosing some of this information that you're saying is being used in these decisions. So maybe David, now I'll go back to you to, to ask about these next couple categories and what you see, you know, CFOs thinking about. The next category that we normally talk about to close off some of our, our, our required bodies is on the tax and regulatory side. And obviously, we're seeing a, a bunch of movement in Europe. There's other movement kind of uh, throughout the world. And on the tax side, um, and as you guys know, I'm not a tax partner, but but what my what my tax partners tell me um, that, that they're tracking along and, and trying to find, too, is people are 
debating about whether the carbon should be, um, you know, a production or a consumption tax. Um, they're talking about, do we, is there going to be a carbon charge for cross-border shipments? Is there going to be, how, how is this going to work in our, in our global connected um, environment, particularly as goods um, and, and potentially services move around the world? Um, the, the short answer is we don't know. You know, obviously that we've got uh, people that have different viewpoints on specific countries and and types of components, but it's a it's an evolving answer that'll come. And on the regulatory side, you know, we we can think about regulatory in a couple of different ways. Not only are our bodies like the SEC, uh, our IFRS governance rules, um, JGAP, et cetera, but also um, the environmental um, agencies, right? The EPA and the and the states, um, et cetera, are also going to have some some play factor in here. Not necessarily for the reporting, but for the actions that you need to take. And so um, there's there's definitely some some evolving components um, there. And then the the fourth category is customers for people like that are consumer markets um, or healthcare. We're not seeing a kind of a demand pull on there for the for the customers. I mean, we do see people that um, are selling B two B and particularly B two B in industries that are being more regulated. So you know, some some of the energy reg, energy companies or some of those are starting to um, to ask their suppliers for more carbon information, and we are seeing it on some of the consumer um, companies that are large and public um, because they know they're going to be asked not by their customers but rather by their investors, and so they're turning around now to their supply chain and saying, "Hey, you need to tell us how much carbon is in." your um, your products that we're buying from you or your services, um, which is going to create kind of a ripple effect down throughout the um, throughout the industry, which is going to be difficult um, at, at some places, to be honest, to to uh, to keep up with. So before we kind of wrap up this segment, I definitely was interested because, as I said, these the internal reporting actually hadn't been as much on my radar. So I'm curious from our listeners' perspective, but how are you thinking about that, David? And how are you talking to your clients about it? Sure. So we're going to divide the internal reporting into the, the two components that I mentioned earlier. And so, you know, a long-term strategic and uh, and what I'll call kind of more of a tactical. So decomposing the tactical, first of all, uh, goes back to something that Brigham alluded to earlier, which is how are you going to assign carbon targets to your people and how are they going to know they're tracking towards meeting those targets? That's a, that's a different level of reporting than um, SEC reporting or even SKU customer level reporting. And we were already seeing people get carbon targets um, and other ESG metrics in their uh, annual review goals. And so when we start thinking about how we're going to measure our people and how we're going to reward them, this starts to become more and more important. And what we're seeing is people are playing with um, with carbon pricing. So, you know, basically trying to put a dollar value to you know carbon or water um, so that it can fit in the budget to actual uh, format flow that we have today. Uh, which is fine. One of the traps we're seeing is a single carbon price is not found to be the most effective because there's some types of carbon that you might be expending in your business that you're not going to get away from and you don't necessarily want people to make that change right now. And there's other types of carbon that you may really want people to be making changes to, um, to how they operate. And so maybe it's not only the electrification of a fleet, maybe it's a different class of airline that you're flying, or maybe it's not flying at all um, and, and doing more virtual. And so that first type of internal reporting is really about how do I drive the change, the reduction of, of carbon, the better water usage, the increased DNI, how do I drive that change within my four walls on a weekly, monthly basis to meet my long-term goals? And how do I decompose those? And it's not as easy as it sounds. Um, and so that's that's the first portion of internal. Well, so David, what you're saying there really is this about getting practical. So I think you mentioned this before. Okay, you might have this net zero goal out there, but this is almost getting to, okay, well, how are we going to achieve that goal? And then how are we going to track the progress against that goal? Absolutely. Yeah. You know, you know it's, it's the old adage. We, uh, what, you, what you don't measure, you don't know. What you don't know, you can't improve. And there so, you go. So. It's, uh, yeah. it, and I think your strategy has to be connected to your measurement approach and your technology system, et cetera. So 
I have one client who is very clear that their their plan is that they're going to buy offsets or at corporate purchase, you know, enter into renewable energy power purchase agreements. Therefore, they've decided they don't need a high level of resolution in their data flowing through because that's the strategic action that they're going to take. So they've taken more of an estimation approach. I have another client who really wants to drive it into the core accountability and the expectations of um, business units, plant managers, et cetera. But the challenge that they have is they built a lot of their reporting to be able to get the top enterprise numbers right. But there's a lot of simplifying assumptions around how things get allocated underneath it. So when they started taking their top numbers and breaking them down uh, into scorecards for um, individual plants, business segments, they got a pretty strong pushback that people didn't feel like the the data coming through really represented anything near reality on the ground at a lower level uh, because of the amount of estimation that had been built into a process in order to, to manage through a, a corporate report. I think this goes back to where we started in the top. You have to come together as an organization to understand what problem you're going to solve so that you set the right requirements and then you build the foundation for all the decisions that you're going to need to inform and feed with this data. Yeah, because because if you're going with the as required um, approach and strategy and um, and you're not going to make commitments to reduce your carbon, but you're going to meet the reporting requirements, then you don't need to track this to see how how low you can reduce it. Right. I mean, so, again, it, Brigham, I completely agree. It's it's all about what are we trying to do? What are we trying to solve? Yeah, although it's interesting because the one thing that stood out to me from all of those categories, maybe a little less the sort of internal tracking, but there's opportunity there and or co future costs, right? And in particular, you know, David, when you made the point about carbon and, you know, carbon taxes and things like that, okay, that's the potential cost that you don't want to be caught by unexpectedly, right? If someplace you are doing business is contemplating that and you're not aware. Or lending, maybe you could get a better rate if you're willing to do something. Or investing, maybe you'll have more investors. So all of them seem like there's either, there's in some way either a, a tax, I'll use that word generally, on your business or an opportunity for your business that goes beyond, again, sort of the theme I guess we've had here, goes beyond just doing sort of the, the minimum or just doing what's required. Yeah. And uh, honestly, I mean, we've all seen business dynamics change um, over over time for, for different sectors. This is this one is changing every sector. And that's that's kind of what's making it interesting. Um, and, and maybe maybe leads me into the into the kind of the sixth type of, of reporting, which is the what I'm calling the strategic. And what what this really is, is companies looking forward. And so all the types of reporting we've talked about before, the first five are all reporting on on what's actually already occurred. And the reason those five types are different, just to clarify, is because the level of detail and the amount of controls that you need to have on the data are all different. And so when we when we talk now about the sixth type, the strategic, it's really about looking forward and saying, all right, when I'm doing my capital allocation process and looking at, at long-term capital buys, when I'm looking at M and A, when I'm looking at at um, at any piece of of large investment on the future, how accurate is the carbon intensity forecast for that activity, and how am I weighing those things in now? And so, for instance, we if we just take a simple example of a of capital capital purchase allocation, you know, we've got we've got three different projects. We've got enough to fund two. Historically, we'd set a hurdle rate. Um, if they're over the hurdle rate, they're they're in. And then we'd look at the ones with the with the biggest return. We'd fund those. Not it's not simple, but again, this is a simple example. But now we have to take carbon into commit into consideration. And so we look at our goals and we say, well, we set this target for 2040. And, you know, we're at, we're at 2022, we've got, th these assets are each going to last 10 years. And we think we need to be at, at half of the, half of our output by 2030 for carbon. And so this third piece of capital, although it has the lowest return, really actually reduces carbon the most. And we kind of need that to, um, to meet our, 
other investor commitments. And so we've got to look at a, at a broader range of, of investor and lender commitments that we're trying to reach beyond just the, the straight return, particularly for our long-term um, components, particularly when we start talking about buying companies. And we are seeing a lot of activity both in the private and public markets um, for companies that are trying to do closed economy and create closed economy loops for uh, carbon um, or water. Um, we're seeing a lot of companies that are um, looking at carbon sequestrant or, or other other pairings that you wouldn't normally see. And the, the multiples for those are, are starting to get high. We're not quite to the to the peak of uh, of the of the software uh, bubble, um, which I remember with uh, with fondness, although not the bust. But uh, now we're looking at um, at companies having some of those higher multiples, and so the cost of making your commitments using inorganic growth is going to increase as we get closer to the big metric days of commitments of 2030, 2040, and twenty fifty. All right. So then with that sort of level set, and I think hopefully, even if we have some skeptics on, they've at least recognized that they they need to be thinking about this. Brigham, with all of that said, what are you really seeing as sort of the key changes that are needed from process controls technology? Right now, sustainability reporting, CSR reporting is managed as a functional level problem that has pretty limited resources. And I think our clients are waking up to realize this is an enterprise scale issue that they're going to have to manage for. And that also means that they need to start thinking about their enterprise assets around technology, systems, infrastructure, architecture, tools that have already been built. So my clients that are furthest along in in this space are really looking at not how do I take some new piece of software or something and introduce it into my environment, but taking their existing technology architecture, looking at where data can be integrated, where controls can be integrated into my overall GRC tools, how my sign-offs and certifications can be integrated into my SOX process. Um, So as a practical first step, what our, our clients are asking us to do is to help them set out, again, what are the problems we're trying to solve? Therefore, what are we going to need across people, process, technology? What does that imply in terms of a technology architecture or blueprint? What are all the boxes that we need to put a name or a system in? And then looking in their existing enterprise technology standards, where can they leverage what they've already invested in uh, for, for other purposes? Where is going to be a gap that's net new or where they need a best of breed type type solution? And then starting to lay that out into a roadmap that they can execute against over time. That's really the, the point where we're seeing uh, our clients that have started moving uh, against either you know, the strategic reporting or the expected regulatory uh, requirements coming out. That's the pathway that we're seeing our clients go down. And I would say what uh, what I'm seeing on this too is the answer partially depends on your strategy and partially depends on which types of reporting you're trying to get to. You know, there's some some technology tools which are are very common for SEC reporting. You probably need to include those for SEC reporting purposes. Um, there are some that are good with big unstructured data. If that's the problem they need to decompose, that's where you need to look at. And I would also say nobody needs all six types of reporting, um, and everybody's got some existing infrastructure. And so it's fitting it into there. But it's, I would say people are finding it difficult because a lot of the underlying data that they need, once they understand what type of reporting they want to have, um, has not been historically captured at the level of detail that they need with the level of accuracy that they want and with the level of controls that are going to be required. All right. So then with with all of that said, maybe David, going back to you again, what are some of the key steps that you see that that companies should be thinking about as they sort of prepare for this new landscape? I would break it down to, to three parts right now um, for, for most companies. But understanding your both your strategy and your reporting needs is is number one. You, you, we got to understand where the where the end destination is and be aligned across the organization. Number two is really starting to get your hands on the data. Like the data is where is where everybody kind of keeps coming back to. It's the long pole in the tent. And then three is understanding 
how we're going to do this on a go forward basis. So, you know, which technologies do we need to have? Um, you know, are we going to do it in house or, or out of house um, as a managed service? And then most importantly, in terms of the, the wrapper is this is going to be a, a lot of, of effort, but a lot of value, especially if it gets combined correctly with businesses' long-term goals. Speaking to you know, fellow finance professionals, and th- this is where we need to lean in. This is where the, adding the value, the insight, and the collaboration leadership for what people need to be doing and how we structure um, our organization and data is key. All right. So then final round of questions, and I'm actually going to go back to where we started, which was those three different categories. And Brigham, I'm going to direct these to you, but David, obviously feel free to free to chime in. So Brigham, if you are meeting with a CFO that's in sort of, I'm going to ask you each one in each of these categories, what is the number one thing you would tell them that they should be focused on right now? So let's start with the leaders. If you're a leader at this point, you have made bold commitments and goals. Um, You have started to mobilize around that, but you probably have not fully hardwired it into the accountability and org structure, budgeting process, annual planning process. I think that's the next horizon. Do I have a forecast on where my target is going to end up over the next couple couple of quarters. Does everybody in my organization understand what they're individually and what their teams are responsible for delivering for us to make this as a whole? I think that's the infrastructure that needs to needs to come into play. I would also say, especially if you're a US company, but a multinational, keep your eye on Europe and what's happening there and the the challenges for how you're going to deliver against those disclosure requirements that might not be front on your dashboard. The only thing I would add to that is, you know, you're there when you can report on your ESG in the same frequency and level of detail as you do the rest of your financial results. If you can get that out in three to five days after each month, Um, then you've got a handle on your data and where you're headed. All right. That's a good benchmark. And I think Brigham, I've heard you use a similar one in the past. So, all right. So then let's move on to fast followers. I I would actually connect fast followers and the, you know, waiting for compliance category together. At this point, there's enough signaling in the market. And we said this before, know where the pain points are, um, know how much time, how much effort, how much lift I think if you're a fast follower, that's starting to tip into know what my options are, good, better, best for how I'm going to solve for that and start thinking through perhaps early design, building out what are the accounting standards, what's the organizational model. You might wait if you're you're in the latter category to start solutioning in on that, but really understanding acutely where the pain is going to be that you're going to have to focus your time. I would do that at a minimum. I might add in the, uh, the the only other piece I would tell a fast follower to be doing right now is to understand if they actually have the data to the level of uh, detail that they want it to be, because that's going to be that's going to be harder to capture over time. A lot of people are using estimates right now. A whole lot of people. All right, and then I think you covered this, Brigham. But other than telling it as uh, the sort of as required category, pay attention. Any other final thoughts for them? One question to to ask yourself, um, and I think this is particularly in the as required category, if you're a leader, maybe you have a chief sustainability officer, but you certainly have somebody who has accountability for ESG in your organization that you know to point to and collaborate with. If you're a fast follower, you, you probably have at least somebody who's dual hatting in that role. If you're in an as required, I would just pause and think, who am I going to ask to be on point to deal with this? And if you can't answer that question, I think just starting to get the accountability structured and socializing because it takes a long time for somebody to ramp on this. All right. I'm glad I asked that question. That's great advice. David, any other final thoughts from you? I think the the only thing that I would share is what companies that are further ahead than, than most are finding is that this is a bigger lift and more complex than they initially thought. And so similar to other changes that, that had, you know, more wrinkles behind there. And I think this one is going to be really in depth because it can affect a large portion of your business kind of across it, across your entire organization. And so you need to just be, be prepared. All right. Well, gentlemen, definitely some good actionable advice. And I uh, really appreciate all the insight. It's a pleasure of talking to you today. Thank you. That's our show for today. 
and the last episode in our Finance 2025 series. If you missed any of the previous episodes, you can view the full library wherever you listen to your podcasts. And join me back here next week for a new lineup of shows. On Tuesday, we're continuing to cruise through our Revenue Toolkit series when we unpack step four of the model, allocating the transaction price. And that's only the start of the new episodes lined up next week. On Thursday, we're looking at SEC's new cyber proposal. And on Friday, a bonus episode to close out the week on the SEC's new climate proposal. So lots to get you updated on before heading into the weekend. So that you never miss any of our audio content, follow the PwC Accounting Podcast series wherever you listen to your podcasts. With two new episodes released each week, there's something for everyone. From Thought Leadership at PwC, I'm Heather Horn. Thanks for tuning in. This podcast is brought to you by PwC, all rights reserved. PwC refers to the U.S. member firm or one of its subsidiaries or affiliates, and they sometimes refer to the PwC network. Each member firm is a separate legal entity. Please see www.pwc.com slash structure for further details. This podcast is for general information purposes only and should not be used as a substitute for consultation with professional advisors.